I'd like to welcome everybody to the last of the 2019 EHE Grand Rounds. Um, we will not have a Grand Rounds in January because of our retreat. The next one will be in February, but in January there's the Menke's Lectureship on January 21st, and you've already been um, told about it, and we'll have more reminders coming up. Today's speaker will be introduced um, by a good colleague of hers, uh, John Groupman. All right, it, so it, it's terrific to welcome Ashi, who traveled all the way, what, two floors? Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, so Ashi Wiraranta is the, the new chair of the Department of Biochemistry. Um, I assume that you're the Evie McCollum yes. professor and a, and a Bloomberg Distinguished Professor. Uh, I've known Ashi for, uh, for quite a while. Uh, she sort of reflects that uh, you can actually start your career at Hopkins leave and, and come back and return. And she was with Bob Cassaro, who's one of our, our joint appointees back uh, in, the, in the early 90s, uh, has been very distinguished in, in her career development. But I think for a lot of the folks here, and, and particularly the students, um, Ashi not only represents uh, the very best in, in mechanistic science and, and developing a keen understanding about how things work, but has actually done the translational work to take the, those types of studies out into the communities. Uh, and the work that she did in Philadelphia with respect to melanoma prevention is, is really a, a cornerstone of what we try and strive for in translating our science and actually bringing it to the public uh, to affect disease. And, and so we were really uh, pleased and, and delighted to, to get Ashi back here uh, in Baltimore. And, uh, and before I forget, because Norma is going to remind me once again, this, uh, this Grand Rounds is being co-sponsored by the, by the Maryland Cigarette Restitution Fund uh, and part of the Lunch, Learn link. So we have an online audience, and I guess we're going to get, uh, we might get questions from, from those folks as well. So without further ado, uh, Ashi, it's, it's all yours. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. So, Almost exactly one year ago, I stood here giving a similar talk as part of my interview process. At the time, I didn't even know if I would end up here at all, and here I am. So um, that's been a lot of fun. Also to all of the trainees in the room, um, when I started at Hopkins on my first day at 20 years old, um, I ended my day by accidentally dumping a bucket of Ethidium on my head. So I am living proof <laughs> that you really can do anything. <laughs> you can start from very humble beginnings. And so today I'm going to tell you about our work. Our lab has been really interested in melanoma, which is a skin cancer that I'll tell you about, and also how as we age, different things in our normal skin can change and drive tumor progression. Can everyone hear me OK? I feel like this thing isn't on. You're good? OK, great. So I like to use a slide when I go out, <laughs> especially given uh, current comments about our city, just to show people that it's actually really lovely in Baltimore. Um, and so melanoma, it's an aggressive form of skin cancer. There are, it's one of the few forms of skin cancer that continues to rise in incidence. And we have over 96,000 new cases of melanoma diagnosed um, every year currently. Melanoma starts out as a proliferation of the, skins, the skin cells um, that give you color, so the ones that produce melanin. These are called melanocytes. When they undergo genetic changes, they start to go awry, they start to proliferate, and initially they grow radially across the surface of your skin, but as they become more and more aggressive, they grow into your skin and uh, start to invade into your dermis and into the sub-Q tissue. And from there, it becomes super dangerous because that's where the cells can then go into the lymphatics and the blood vessels invade and colonize distant parts of the body. I'm sorry, my sound is on and I don't know how to turn it off. So I apologize. <laughs> so um, the first problem is that melanoma spreads all over your body, as I just said. The second problem is that although we have amazing new therapies to treat melanoma today, not all patients are eligible for these therapies and not all patients respond to these therapies. And then the third and perhaps the worst problem is that even patients who do respond will ultimately relapse. So my lab is interested in what drives the spread of melanoma, because if we could keep it on the skin, that would be great. You could just lop off bits of the skin and you'd be fine. We're, under, we're interested in understanding why these metastatic cells resist therapy and how all of this is governed by the microenvironment, so what's going on around the tumor. 
We've been particularly interested in age. As I said, the incidence of most cancers uh, increase with age, and we think of cancer as a disease of aging. And um, you can see that, is there a pointer? Here, I'll use this. And you can see that as um, a population ages, the incidence of cancer increases. Uh, worse than that, your ability to survive the cancer, either a recurrence of the cancer or survive overall, decreases with each decreasing decade of age. And so um, our work on aging has really started to uncover multiple aspects of tumor progression um, that are affected by aging. And so um, we know that aging affects therapy resistance, the metabolism of tumor cells, the way they metastasize, how the immune microenvironment changes, and um, whether or not cells can awaken from a state that we call dormancy. I'm gonna to talk to you about three of these topics. Um, apart from the fact they're all induced by aging fibroblasts, they're rather um, unrelated to each other in a way. So I will stop with a break in between each section. So I like to use this slide because this shows you the very visible effects of aging. Um, these two presidents went in bright-eyed and bushy-tailed into their presidency and only eight years later came out with gray hair and wrinkles. Um, I'm leaving our current president off because he's giving me wrinkles, but that's a topic for another discussion. So um, you can, so why do we get wrinkles? So that was something we were really interested about and in, interested in. So um, the reason that you get wrinkles is that because when you are young and you have young skin, you have cross links uh, between collagen and elastin that are held together with molecules of hyaluronic acid. As you age, these molecules start to break down. Um, the collagen and the elastin bonds break and the skin starts to fold in on itself and that's why you get wrinkles. And so we asked whether this could affect the way tumor cells move within this space. So what we did was um, to use a technique that we have uh, perfected over the last few years um, that we learned from my colleague at the Wistar, Dr. Meinhard Herlin, and that is a technique of making artificial skin. And the beauty of this model is that you can make um, a 3D, what we call reconstruct, that looks under the microscope almost exactly like human skin, minus things like hair follicles and blood vessels. And what we see is that, I really wish I had a pointer. Can you guys see okay with the mouse? Okay, so um, what we see is that when we take melanoma cells, now the mouse is gone, okay. And when we take melanoma cells and we embed them in these skin reconstructs at the surface of the skin, and these reconstructs, oh, thank you, your star. Um, and these reconstructs are made with fibroblasts from young healthy donors in their 20s or early 30s, those melanoma cells remain tightly nested at the surface of the skin. If we do the same thing, use these same cells and now put them in a skin reconstruct that we made with uh, fibroblasts from healthy donors in their mid-50s to mid-60s, those cells start to invade into the dermis and eventually will metastasize, if they, were in a, if they were in actual skin, would metastasize to distant sites. So we asked what that matrix looked like. And remember, the only thing that is different between the way we make these is the age of the fibroblasts that we put in. Everything else is the same. Uh, young fibroblasts make a collagen that is very dense, it's shown by the red, whereas aged fibroblasts make a collagen that is more striated and nowhere near as dense. If we take normal skin that doesn't have tumor cells um, and we simply look, this is mouse skin, we simply look at the collagen arrangement in the skin using two photon microscopy, you can see that in the young skin you have collagen that is very dense and in the aged skin it seems to be organized into these fibrils with a lot of space in between the collagen. This was all done by a very talented graduate student in my lab, Aman, um, who's now a postdoc at Penn. So this was kind of confusing to us at the time because a lot of work from people we really admire like Valerie Weaver and Zeno Werb and other people have shown us that as the extracellular matrix becomes more stiff, tumor cells are actually more and more likely to metastasize. And so our data suggesting that tumor cells were metastasizing more when the matrix became less stiff was very confusing. And so we started to think about the origin of these cells. Skin cells come from a matrix that of necessity has to be really, really stiff. It has to protect you from uh, the sun, the rain, bacteria, all of these other things. Uh, the breast cells, on the other hand, start out in a matrix that is really soft and very plastic. And so we asked the question, was there sort of a sweet spot for invasion where the matrix around the breast cancer cells had to stiffen and the matrix around the uh, melanoma cells had to soften in order for these things to move. 
So we model this um, computationally with our colleague Dr. Vivek Chenoy from Penn and then Marie Webster in my lab at the time who's now gone on to start her own lab um, modeled this in the laboratory. What she did was to grow melanoma cells in spheroids, so you're looking at a clump of melanoma cells here, and she embedded them in different stiffnesses and densities of collagen. What she found was that indeed, as she, if she placed them in very, very soft collagen, as with the breast cancer data from Val and Zena, these cells did not migrate away from the center of the spheroid. As she started increasing the collagen stiffness, the cells started to invade more, that's what you're seeing here. Um, but then once she increased the collagen stiffness even further, she found that it kept the cells close to the spheroid and they stopped migrating. So it tells us that there was really this sort of bell curve for invasion. So once we had established that and felt a lot better about that, we went back to um, our other studies. And uh, sorry, this is just to show you, um, you know, if you were a tumor cell trying to get through a matrix that looks like this and it's very stiff and there's kind of nowhere to go and you're trying to get through, as you age and as that matrix starts to break down, there becomes more and more room for the tumor cell. So the way we were looking at this was to think of those fibers as essentially a trap that kept the tumor cells in that needed to stiffen and align before the tumor cells could move. We wanted to know what was doing this to the tumor cells, and so we took our young fibroblasts and our aged fibroblasts, and we did a proteomics analysis um, of their secretome, so what were they secreting? And um, we identified this protein, Haplin-1, as by far the most increased in young fibroblasts, and it was almost completely lost in aged fibroblasts. And so we asked whether Haplin-1 um, could have a role. Uh, in this matrix degradation that we were seeing. And the reason we asked that is because you can think of Haplin-1 as the knitting needles that knots together the hyaluronic acid with the collagen and the elastin. So to maintain that structure I showed you in the slide with the presidents, you need a molecule of collagen and elastin and then a molecule of hyaluronic acid holding those together. And when Haplin-1 is there, that's what's responsible for making that connection. Once you lose it, those connections start to fall apart. So we looked in normal skin and we found that Haplin-1 was, was indeed lost in aged skin. Um, it's lost in melanomas as people age. So in patient, if we look at patient age by decade, younger patients still have Haplin-1 in the skin around the melanoma, older patients lose it. If we go back to those mouse skin studies that I showed you, um, you can see that in the young mice, uh, the collagen is very dense uh, again and the, uh, in the age it's arranged into these fibrils. But now if we take those age mice and we give them back Haplin-1, we can knot this collagen back up again. So um, the next thing we wanted to do was to understand how Haplin-1 affected the organization of the matrix. And so uh, we collaborated with my friend Etika Kierman, who's at Fox Chase, and she does these beautiful assays where she takes fibroblasts, she encourages them to make matrix, and then she removes the fibroblasts and images just the matrix. The way she images the matrix is to go in and image it from multiple different angles, and when she does that, it refracts light at a different wavelength, which creates different colors. And so if a matrix is very tightly cross-linked, you see a bunch of beautiful colors, like here. So this is what a matrix uh, laid down by a young fibroblast looks like. If we knock down Haplin-1 in the young fibroblast, they now lay matrices that are very oriented in a single direction. So these are what we call aligned. Um, if we go back and add in uh, recombinant Haplin-1, we knot the matrix back up again and make another colorful, highly cross-linked matrix. The aged fibroblasts start out looking like the um, ECM without the Haplin-1. It's very aligned. If we use denatured Haplin-1, not much happens. But if we use recombinant Haplin-1, we can knock this, mat knot this matrix back up again and make it really stiff. So now we knew that we could use Haplin-1 to manipulate the stiffness of these matrices. And so we asked whether that could change the way tumor cells move. So these are um, reconstructs made with aged fibroblasts. If we treat them with Haplin-1, um, the melanoma cells don't invade as effectively. If we make the skin reconstructs with young fibroblasts in which we've knocked down Haplin-1, the tumor cells invade more dramatically. Um, then we looked at um, if we modulated Haplin-1 in vivo, what would happen? Interestingly, the tumors don't grow as well, um, but they also don't metastasize. Uh, in melanoma, growth and invasion is uncoupled. Usually, if a tumor doesn't grow very well, it metastasizes more efficiently, so this was a bit of a surprise to us. And we asked why these tumors were not growing as well. 
If we looked at the proliferation rate of the tumors, um, they were identical, so it wasn't the fact that they were proliferating. So we asked if maybe the immune system was playing a role, because um, we knew that immune cells have very different ways of using the extracellular matrix. For example, um, in a situation that you have a pore size, so these are beautiful experiments done by Peter Friedel's lab, um, and if you use eight micron pores and you put a cancer cell through, it can move, but by the time you get to five micron pores, the cancer cells are no longer able to move through those pores. Um, as you can see from this picture, tumor, uh, immune cells are a very different size than the tumor cells, and so you can think of it as, you know, a trap where tumor cells can't move, but the immune cells still can, and that's exactly what's happening here. In addition to that, um, immune cells love having stiff collagen, and they use them sort of like a kid uses a jungle gym to pull themselves in and out of tumors. And um, so we asked whether there was a differential movement between immune and tumor cells. To do this, we modified our skin reconstructs um, and introduced immune cells into these. So we have melanoma cells, which in the next movie you're going to see in red. Um, we have fibroblasts, so either young or aged, or aged plus or minus haplin, which you'll see in the next movie. And then we have the immune cells that are going to be labeled in green. Um, and these immune cells are autologously matched to the melanoma cells. They come from the same patients. So um, we wanted to ask how the immune versus uh, the, uh, the melanoma cells moved. Uh, again, melanoma cells, immune cells, there are fibroblasts all around. You can't see them because they're not labeled. And they're aged in this particular movie. Oh, sorry. So um, let's. Oh. Not working. There we go. So what we see is in the aged condition, the tumor cells. I don't know. Ah, I don't know how well you can see that. <laughs> Not very well right now. Let's try that again. Okay. Um, what happens is that the tumor cells will move up, but the immune cells remain trapped at the surface. Um, however, if we add in haplin one, we start to see that the immune cells are able to fly down and attack the melanoma cells just because we've given them some structure to use. This is very disturbing. This is why I have these still pictures so you can see exactly what I just showed you. We can measure the distance and the velocity of these immune cells as well. So of course, if you talk to any immunologist, they will tell you that uh, in vitro immune work has no bearing on anything in real life and it all has to be done in mice, so we did that. Um, and what we found is that if we treat age mice with haplin-1, uh, we can increase the number of cells coming into the tumor, the um, immune cells in general. Um, a lot of these are CD8 positive cells, which are the good T cells. Um, they help to kill the tumor. And uh, some of these other populations don't change. But what was super interesting was that this population, the PMM DSCs, which are polymorphonuclear myeloid derived suppressor cells, changed quite dramatically and they were um, much lower in the haplin 1 conditions. Uh, these cells are also responsible for the recruitment of T regulatory cells, which can counteract the good effects of the CD8 cells. And if you look at the way um, PMN MDSCs look over here compared to T cells, it tells us that this phys biophysical effects on the tumor matrix can actually really be having an effect on things like um, immune infiltration as well as tumor metastasis. So as I mentioned, I'm now going to abruptly shift gears into the next story. And I'm going to tell you um, a little bit about tumor dormancy and how aging can affect that. So again, um, as I just mentioned, you know, the fibroblasts are sort of the construction workers of the skin. They're secreting all sorts of things, including haplin-1. And I'm just going to skip through this. And we have done this in vitro. We've also done it in vivo. This is a mouse model of melanoma. Um, when we take these tumors, we can grow them, and then we can, we can inject them back into the mice so they're in an intact immune microenvironment. And so what we can do is to literally take a flask of these cells, split them in half, put half in a young mouse and half in an aged mouse, and ask what happens. And so when we do that, we see something quite interesting. Uh, we see that the tumors do not grow anywhere as well in the aged mice. However, they have far more angiogenesis, and they metastasize much more dramatically to the lung. And so um, we asked the question, was this a difference in the rate of metastasis or a different in, difference in the outgrowth of metastatic cells in the lung? <clears throat> so Mitch Fain in the lab, who's moving here to Hopkins with me, um, took young mice and aged mice. 
And what he did was to put tumors in the skin of the young mice and aged mice, and then wait, oh, he did this actually over a series of every week, look in the lungs of the mice to see how many tumor cells had gone to the lungs and what was happening to them. What he found was by three weeks, both young and aged mice had single tumor cells that were lodged in the lung. But by five weeks, the cells that remained as single cells in the young were growing out dramatically in the age. Now remember, genetically, these cells are identical. The only difference is the age of the mice in which they've been put in. So these mice are eight weeks old. These mice are a year old, actually 18 months old. Um, and this is just a quantification of that data. So we asked, was there something in the lung microenvironment that was making these cells grow out more rapidly? And so we took our melanoma cells labeled in green. We co-cultured them with um, young and aged fibroblasts from the lung, as well as lung young and aged fibroblasts from the skin. And we find that the um, green melanoma cells here uh, proliferate rapidly when they're co-cultured with the aged lung fibroblasts. This is the opposite of what we see with the skin, because the same melanoma cells with the skin fibroblasts grow much better with the young skin fibroblasts um, and not as well with the age. This is just a quantification of the data. So we asked, what was the difference in the secretome from the young and aged skin fibroblasts and the young and aged lung fibroblasts? And you can see how very, um, these experiments were done six years apart. So you can see the proteomics develop very rapidly <laughs> over time. Um, and we have a lot more hits now. We've gone back and redone this with the skin fibroblasts just so that we can be more comparable. But something that really struck us was the fact that in the H skin, there was a very strong signature of non-canonical Wnt signaling, and I'll explain that in just a second. The aged lung fibroblasts, on the other hand, promoted canonical Wnt signaling, and so these two pathways work very antagonistically to each other. And the reason that we, and the, yeah, two of the molecules that really drove this were SFRP2 in the aged skin and SFRP1 in the aged lung, which again have opposing effects to each other. So this was really interesting to us because for maybe the first eight years of my lab, we had really focused on Wnt signaling. Uh, the Wnt ligands are growth factors that are very important in development. Um, they drive in uh, melanocyte development, for example, the migration of the melanoma cells from the neural crest. Um, actually, Leslie was telling me last night about the vitiligo in her mice, and I thought, oh, maybe Wnt's involved in that. <laughs> so um, anyway, uh, so, Canonical winds drive an emergence uh, from melanocyte senescence, um, and they drive proliferation. So you need them to transform melanocytes. However, um, if beta-catenin and the wnt one 3 a pathway still express, those cells don't metastasize as effectively. And instead, you now need wnt 5 a to shut that all off and drive invasion and metastasis. And so this whole growing and going phenomenon is very, um, in melanoma is a very opposite um, phenomenon. And if a cell is growing, it's rarely going, and if it's going, it's rarely growing. So, um, so Marie Webster in my lab, um, who is now starting her own lab, looked at all of our cell lines, and she found that wherever we found cells that were slow cycling, they seemed to have very high Wnt5a. If she knocked down Wnt5a, she could drive these cells out of their slow cycling phenotype and into a rapidly cycling phenotype. Um, and she's just published this work. It's fascinating because it involves P53, and unlike every cancer researcher in the world, um, our goal is to inhibit P53 <laughs> in these cells instead of activate it. Um, but that's a whole, whole other story. Um, and so Mitch decided to look at Wnt5a to see if he could see how it uh, governed metastatic outgrowth. So the first thing he did was to uh, make cells that he could induce with doxycycline to lose Wnt5a, which is this upper band. Um, and when he does that, he turns off mar other markers um, of this going phenotype, including Axel P21, and he drives markers of the growing phenotype, like MITF. I'll come back to that in a second. So if he takes these mice and he gives them doxycycline, he gives it to them either right away, um, there's, no, there's not much metastasis at all here, um, and then when these mice when he looks at five weeks, the metastasis is uh, just as we expect in the young mice. So these are young mice. Now, if he waits three weeks, or and then he turns on the Wnt5a, turns off the Wnt5a, I'm sorry, the cells start to grow very dramatically. 
And when we were looking at these histopathology side, I said to Mitch, this looks like a very angry octopus. So I just stuck that in there. <laughs> So, um, so that tells us then that you need the WNT5A to get to the lungs, but once it's in the lungs, if you shut it off, you're going to get this rapid outgrowth because usually when we look at the young lungs at five weeks, they still look like this. So that was really interesting. And so we asked whether WNT5A was playing a role in dormancy and what the age-related role of WNT5A in tumor dormancy might be. To do this, we collaborated with my good friend, Julio Giraguiso, who's at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York. And Julio is really a world expert in tumor dormancy. He's identified signatures of tumor dormancy, including Axel, um, NR2F1, et cetera, et cetera. And so we worked with him to look at dormancy signatures in our cells. He sees similar dormant signatures in breast cancer cells that we see in melanoma cells. And if we go to um, the TCGA data set, which is a cancer genome atlas, and we look at all of the melanomas that are either WNT5A low or WNT5A high, and we look at these markers that Julio came up with. Um, wherever we have high WNT5A, we have high expression of all of these dormancy markers. If we look at the markers that drive proliferation, it's exactly the opposite. Wherever we have high WNT5A, we lose proliferation, which goes hand in hand with our data that shows that WNT5A drives a slow cycling phenotype. So we asked whether age-related uh, changes in the lung could regulate these dormant signatures. and. Um, to do this, what we did was to take our melanoma cells, incubate them with young and age fibroblast conditioned media, and ask uh, what would happen to the expression of these genes. So in the age microenvironment, we lose expression of the dormancy markers, and we gain expression of the proliferation markers. So it really confirms what we're seeing in the animals, that this age microenvironment is driving this shift from an invasive, non-proliferative phenotype to this highly proliferative phenotype. So um, in this model then, if we implant tumors in the skin of young or aged mice, we see that um, the cells, probably the WNT5A high cells and not necessarily the MITF or beta-catenin high cells, go to the lung. However, in the young lung, they kind of sit there and don't do much, they lie dormant. In the aged lung, with all of these changing microenvironmental influences, um, they start to grow out, and uh, we have evidence that they're switching phenotype because this is actually a very plastic phenotype between the two different kinds of WNT signals. What was also um, curious to us was that several years ago, completely unrelated, we had published that WNT5A regulated the expression of tumor-associated antigens. So MITF is actually a driver. WNT5A suppresses MITF, <laughs> shuts it off, affects proliferation but also affects the way these cells signal to the immune system. So these melanoma cells, um, have, if they have MITF and all of the associated antigens, they put them on their surface and they kind of wave at the immune system and say, hey, we're here. The cells come in, attack the tumor, and um, that affects tumor growth. So we asked whether the immune microenvironment in the lung was changing. When we looked at our um, proteomics data, we see that fibroblasts secrete things like arginase 1 and CXCL1, and those are, um, those are molecules that we know drive immunosuppression. They are important for the attraction of myeloid-derived suppressor cells into the immune microenvironment. And so we looked at the young and aged lung and saw that, sure enough, we have more myeloid-derived suppressor cells and therefore more T regulatory cells. So that tells us that the microenvironment in the aged lung is much more immunosuppressive then is much less immunosuppressive than the microenvironment in the young lung. And what that means is that cells that normally would be killed or taken off by the um, immune system now don't have to worry about that as much. Um, and again, the, the good cells, the CD8 and CD4 cells, are uh, far reduced in the age lung. So if we take uh, molecules that deplete MDSCs, whether we attack CXCL1 directly or whether we use a trail which will target the MDSCs directly, uh, we can then reduce the grow outgrowth of the melanoma cells in the lung. So that was um, pretty exciting. And um, I actually took that data out. Oh, I didn't. I left it in. Oh, good. OK. <laughs> I thought I took that out. So you know, um, given the fact that WIN5A is so important in all of this, we asked whether there was a link between WIN signaling and myeloid-derived suppressor cells. So Stephen in my lab, who will also move here uh, to Hopkins, to so say hi if you see them in the hallway. Um, the WIN5A high cells have markers of um, MDSC activation as well. 
And so Stephen isolated MDSCs from the bone marrow, spleen, and tumors in mice. And he found that MDSCs in the tumor cells had huge amounts of 1,5A, um, which was really unexpected. And it, they were far more than our melanoma cells, actually, which was surprising. So in collaboration with Dr. Dmitry Gabrilovich, who discovered MDSCs, who's at Wistar, and Reggie Kuravilla, who's here at Hopkins, who made a WIN5A um, flox flox mouse. We made transgenic mice in which uh, WIN5A was knocked out, but specifically in the myeloid-derived suppressor cells. What uh, Stephen saw was that um, in MDSCs without WIN5A, uh, there were fewer in general in the tumors. Um, and if he looked at their ability to suppress T cells, he found that um, those MDSCs that did not have WIN5A was not as able to effectively suppress T cell activity as those that did. Um, and this was the best part of all of this because by knocking WIN5A out, not of the tumor cells, but of the myeloid-derived suppressor cells, Stephen could almost completely ablate metastasis. So just by depleting WIN5A in the, immune, in the tumor microenvironment, he could affect the ability of these cells to migrate from the skin to the lung. So that um, has been a really fun project to work on with both Stephen and Mitch. So, um, so what we're thinking right now is that, again, there are secreted factors by the fibroblasts that affect not only the plasticity of these melanoma cells, allowing them to grow uh, where normally they wouldn't, but also the fact that it affects the immune system and creates a less immunosuppressive microenvironment that would normally edit these cells by recognizing the signals they put on themselves but instead they can now grow and outgrow rapidly. So I'll end the talk with um, the last section. This is a super fun project that we're just resubmitting. Um, and this is all work done by an incredibly talented graduate student, Gretchen Alisea, in my lab. So Gretchen has always had a deep interest in things like macropinocytosis, autophagy, lipid metabolism. And so she wanted to look at the way fibroblasts have different energies as they age. And what she found was that when she um, looked at young and age fibroblasts, fibroblast, the age fibroblasts, even in low sugar conditions, would make a lot of lipids. And so I'm not a metabolomics expert by any stretch of the imagination, but what my good colleagues at the Wistar explained to me was that cells take up glucose through this glucose transporter. Um, and the glucose can go through multiple different pathways, but one of the pathways through which they go is to end up making lipids. And so um, we asked if we increase the glucose, could we increase the levels of lipids that these cells make? So the lipids are in red. You can see in the aged fibroblasts, it's dramatic. They make a ton more lipids and they're secreting them all over the place. And if you um, block this transporter, the aged fibroblast, even in high sugar conditions now, the aged fibroblasts are nowhere as effective as making lipids as they are if you don't block the reporter. So Gretchen did some lipidomics analysis. Um, she took young and age fibroblasts, and she found that not only the levels of lipids differ between the young and age uh, fibroblasts, but also the different classes. Um, and then she asked, and this was, sorry, um, this, was in the secre this was secreted by the lipids, so she looked at the, the lipids in the secretome. And then she asked um, whether that could affect the lipids in the melanoma cells. So she took conditioned media from young and age fibroblasts and she put it on melanoma cells. I'm just showing you one of the lines. She's done this in multiple. And you can see that the moment these cells see age conditioned media, they go from having very little lipid to a ton of lipid. And that's quantitated on the right. If she knocks out the ability of the aged lipids to make fatty acids by inhibiting fatty acid synthase, um, and then uses that condition media. She shows that the control still take, the cells still take up lipids, but if the, mal if the fibroblasts are no longer making and secreting lipids, then the melanoma cells don't increase their level of lipids. So that tells us uh, very specifically that it's probably the fact that they're physically secreting the lipids and not a growth factor that's telling the melanoma cells to make lipids, although that is happening to some extent too, if I'm being completely honest. Um, another experiment that Gretchen did to, to see if it was more weighted towards the side of these fibroblasts secreting actual lipids that the melanoma cells were taking up was to um, treat the melanoma cells with a fatty acid synthase inhibitor. When you do that, the melanoma cells will die because they need that fatty acid to survive. And so here they are dying in the control conditions. 
Um, if you incubate them first with young conditioned media, they don't care, they still die. But now if you incubate them with age conditioned media, they're somewhat protected by, um, from cell death. So that tells us again that they're probably getting the lipids they need to survive just from the conditioned media. And finally, our last sort of piece of evidence that the cells were taking um, the lipids up from the aged fibroblasts was um, Gretchen took aged fibroblasts and young fibroblasts. She stained them with this stable Bodipi dye called Bodipi C12. She then washed that dye out and incubated them with melanoma cells that had been tagged with GFP. So basically, this is what the schema looks like. And anything that's green is a melanoma cell. Any red that is present in either the fibroblasts or the melanoma cells has to come from only the fibroblasts. So when you put this together, um, the melanoma cells, again, they're the same melanoma cells, incubated with the aged fibroblasts, um, the, I'm sorry, with the young fibroblasts, don't take up too much lipid. They take up some, but not a lot. With the aged fibroblasts, you can see that the, every single melanoma cell has some level of orange, and some of them look like this guy with a green nucleus and completely red cytoplasm. So they're really um, taking up the uh, lipids from these aged fibroblasts. So of course, um, we wanted to know how they were doing that. We looked at a bunch of different fatty acid transporters in the cell, and we um, found that the only one that was really upregulated in the age condition media conditions was uh, FATP2. So these are melanoma cells conditioned with media from different young and age fibroblasts. Um, if we make reconstructs with young and age fibroblasts, we also see that FATP2 is dramatically increased only in the age condition in the melanoma cells. It's true for mouse tumors in young and aged mice, and it's too, true in patients as well, where older patients, melanoma patients, have much higher levels of FATP2 in their melanoma cells. And so um, the other interesting thing is when we looked at the patient data, we also found that patients who receive um, the key therapy that we use to treat melanoma called BRAF MEK inhibition um, that targets an oncogene in melanoma, those patients who received the treatment and then survived for several years um, had very little fat P2. Those that received the treatment and then recurred rapidly had very high levels of fat P2 in their tumors. So this told us that not only um, was fat P2 something we might be able to target in melanoma cells in older patients, it might be something that we want to target in conjunction with these uh, BRAF MEK inhibitors. So we took our melanoma cells, we knocked down uh, FATP2, and now we expose them to age-conditioned media, and you can see that um, they no longer are able to effectively take up the lipids from the age-conditioned media. And then we decided to go to an in vivo system. So we took um, those melanoma cells, those mouse melanoma cells I told you about before that we've taken from the transgenic mice, and now we can put them back in the um, C57 black 6 mice. And we made a dox-inducible knockdown of fat P2 in those cells. This is, so this experiment gets a little bit complicated, but these are young mice. Um, if we have, uh, if we knock down fat P2 or in the control, there's no difference in growth, so it doesn't affect the growth of the tumor. Um, these melanoma cells in young mice, the same melanoma cells, will respond to the drug, but eventually they regress. Um, in the age mice, however, we see a completely different story. We see that um, what we've already known, which is that they don't respond to the targeted therapy at all. Um, but then if you, give, if you knock down the FATP2 in conjunction with the targeted therapy, you get a dramatic difference in the ability of these cells to grow. So targeting FATP2 might be a way to overcome the age-related therapy resistance we see in age patients. How is this happening? Why are they resistant to therapy? Um, so we looked at a lot of different things. We first thought that maybe um, you know, the lipids in the melanoma cells were acting as a sink for the drugs. That's not the case. The drug is still reaching its target. We can tell that by looking at the signaling pathways. Um, but what we came to realize was that fatty acid oxidation is absolutely critical for melanoma cells to resist therapy. And what we find is that uh, melanoma cells grown in an age microenvironment have higher levels of uh, CPT1, which is carnitine pyrimidylase transferase. Um, and what that means is that if we target FATP2, they're not getting what they need in terms of the CPT1 going to the mitochondria. We send these cells into mitochondrial distress. And you can see here that um, the aged 
uh, the melanoma cells incubated in age media have very different responses to PlexMEC um, than those in young media, and if we treat them with the FAP-P2 inhibitor, we can dramatically drop their ability to survive, and we can create mitochondrial <coughs> toxicity. Um, so this is just lipidomics analysis to confirm that many of the lipids we see upregulated in H fibroblast media um, can also affect melanoma cells. Ceramides seem to be a big group that are both secreted by the fibroblasts and taken up by melanoma cells. And so we did a quick experiment where we grew our melanoma cells in spheroids. Um, and we t these are melanoma cells in spheroids in a young conditioned environment. Again, if we give them BRAF and MEK inhibitors, we can kill them. That's what the red is showing you. However, if we first pretreat them with ceramides, um, they're no longer able to respond to the drug as well. So it tells us that ceramides might be having a really important role in this mitochondrial toxicity that we see. Um, and this is just a quantification of the data. So I'm going to stop there because I've inundated you with a lot of data, and I hope it hasn't been too intense. I tend to talk fast and a lot. Um, but I hope I've managed to convince you that aging is really important and has, multiple af uh, has effects on multiple aspects of tumor progression. Um, we see it having effects on the matrix, on angiogenesis, which I didn't speak about today, metabolism, and different aspects of metastasis from tumor dormancy to matrix changes. So something that we don't do well in the cancer field is to consider the aging microenvironment when we're treating patients or when we're designing preclinical trials, and I'm hoping that eventually I'll persuade enough people to believe in this stuff so that that will change. And since we're at the School of Public Health, I'll just close by saying why is this even important on a public health aspect? Um, well, if you think about the fact that tumors take off after the age of 60, um, and that our population is rapidly aging and almost a quarter of our population will be over the age of 50, you can think of this as a really significant public health burden. And I'll close with the amazing people who do all the work. I think I've mentioned them as I go along, but we really are a team and they're wonderful. I need to update the slide because a couple of um, my new Hopkins people are not on it yet. These are the amazing collaborators at the Wistar Institute. And melanoma is really a global um, field. It's across the country and across all of the continents. And I'll close with my favorite aging study, who's my daughter, who's about to turn 15. So I'll have to update that slide too. And I'm happy to take any questions. So a quick question, is the effect of aging that you're seeing, is, it, is this a continuum or is there like a trans, a non-linear effect that suddenly at 60 or a menopause and women, is there some um, dynamic change in the slope of the effect of aging? So it's definitely a continuum, um, but I will say that as whenever we're doing the statistics and looking at patient populations, we get very defined cutoffs and that cutoff occurs between 52 and 67. So there's that range of about 15 years where things start to really accelerate. I mean, are, are, there, are there enough data now in terms of a number of the current immunotherapies that are going on in melanoma to, that's actually, that's also consistent with, with the age and, if you will, uh, cure time? So that's a great question. So. We did a study a couple of years ago that looked at uh, anti-PD-1 over 500 patients. And what we looked at was response. And what we found is that older patients actually had a much better response to immunotherapy than younger patients. The reason being is that older patients actually have far fewer T regulatory cells in their tumors than younger patients do. And younger patients obviously are being exposed to more newer immune hits, so they need to regulate that better, so they naturally have more Tregs. Um, however, we have not yet had enough data to look at the survival and overall response. So we know what, you know, the response is and stable disease, but the ultimate overall survival we haven't had a chance to look at yet. Absolutely. Um, so in the dermis, not so much in terms of layer. 
But we've been doing this study where we're looking at fibroblasts from different organs, because our study in the lung showed us that the, what's happening in the lung during aging is exactly the opposite of what's happening in the skin. Um, so we've looked at lymphatic fibroblasts that behave a lot like skin fibroblasts. Um, liver and lung fibroblasts look a lot alike. And so it's kind of fascinating because um, there is heterogeneity, obviously, within each organ, uh, but it's not as dramatic as a heterogeneity from organ to organ, which makes sense. And I think part of the reason is that, that the aged fibroblasts that are secreting all these things, they're very dominant. So if we put aged fibroblasts with young fibroblasts, they turn the young fibroblasts age. But the young fibroblasts are not as effective in stopping the aged fibroblasts. So you can do all of these sort of mixing experiments. Um, so I think some of the strength of the effect overcomes some of the heterogeneity. So that's, that's a great question. Um, it looks like adipocytes that secrete lipids for some reason, and it's probably the classes of lipids that they secrete, don't trigger fat P2, they trigger fat P1. And so there are six different fat Ps. Only fat P2 and fat P6, which is rarely found in adult organs, it's usually in the developing heart, are affected by age, at least in our studies. Um, but I'm absolutely sure, you know, there are data showing that obesity can affect things like CD36 and FATP1. Um, it doesn't seem to be the case here, and there's really weird clinical data suggesting that if you're an obese male, you have a much better chance of surviving melanoma if you get BRAF-MEK inhibitors. <laughs> So there's something in the, and we don't understand that that's like a, you know, a whole systemic thing. So, and of course, if you're a woman, it doesn't matter. You have no protection, which sucks. So, <laughs> yes. Um, in the patient population, is an aging individual equivalent to an aging microenvironment? So, like, can older individuals actually have a young yes. Vice versa, yes. And I'm so glad you asked that question because it gives me a chance to get on my soapbox because whenever we see young patients that look like old patients, just in terms of their fibroblasts, um, I can almost 100% guarantee you that's a young woman who tanned. So um, what we are beginning to look at too are differences in things like melanin in the skin, you know, uh, people who look like me and you, tend to wrinkle a lot less, um, partly because we don't go out in the sun as much, but also there are differences in the collagen structures in our skin. And so those are all things that play into it. <clears throat> Anyone else? Thank you. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>